Chapter 12 Philippians 3, 2-12 Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcise the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Once again, we meet yet another church under attack from Judaizers, this time at Philippi. As always, the agitators wanted to take the believers under the law, especially in those early days with respect to circumcision. But as I have shown, it was the law which was the issue. As before, the Judaizers mistakenly argued for the oneness of the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants, and that if Gentiles want to become children of Abraham, they must be circumcised. That is, they must go under the law of Moses. And again, as always, Paul stood up to the Judaizers. He would have none of it. And he was prepared to fight it out, as it were, every inch of the way, opening his account in the most abrupt manner, even to the extent of starting with his conclusion he twice commanded his readers to beware of the false apostles, to beware of their teaching and their practice. Moreover, he chose a highly insulting way of defining those he had in his sights, calling them dogs and evil workers. Notice further the apostle's use of Jewish terminology and his calling upon one of his favorite devices, wordplay. None of this was an accident. Right from the start, the apostle was deliberately setting the tone for what he wanted to say. He was categorical. Despite the plausible claims of the Judaizers, all believers, without any resort to the law, are the true people of God, the true Israel. We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, he was telling the Philippians, in no uncertain terms, that they ought to have every confidence that entirely in Christ, only in and through Christ, and without any reference to the law, all was well between them and God, and that they should on no account entertain any notion of going under the law. No law works, no Jewish rites were necessary. Their rejoicing, their boasting in Christ and his work alone proved beyond question that through the Redeemer they were already right with God. They were justified. Hence they must not encourage the Judaizers, they must not listen to their teaching, they must shut their ears, minds and hearts to the claims of the lawmongers, those evil dogs.
But Paul did not leave it there. He went on to do far more than merely declare these facts. As I say, he fought it out, blow by blow, with those who were trying to impose the law on believers. Let me trace it out. At every point, he stood his ground. At every stage, he proved that his Jewish credentials matched those of the false teacher. More, they outdid them. His claims for law works were impeccable. What about theirs? Circumcision. Could the Judaizers stay with Paul on that? He himself had been circumcised the eighth day, which, of course, put him in the topmost bracket. Let them match that if they could. That's the first thing. And so he goes on. He had been born a Jew. Born a Jew. He was no proselyte. He had his genealogical qualifications. What were theirs? And what about the law? Could they match his devotion to the law as a Pharisee? What about zeal for God? Had he not shown remarkable enthusiasm for the public glory of God, even to the dedication of his life to the fanatical persecution of the church, Christ in his people? As for the observance of the law, he had in his own eyes, and in the eyes of others, been blameless. True, his righteousness would have been at best external, and not without at least a tinge of self-righteousness. But nevertheless, he certainly passed muster as a law-conforming Jew. No one could contradict him. The Judaizers couldn't match him, let alone beat him, on that score. That's for sure. Compare Galatians 1, 13 to 14. But when Christ confronted Saul of Tarsus on his approach to Damascus, all his religion, based on the law, collapsed in ruins. All his law righteousness, all his self-righteousness, crumbled to dust and ashes. He was in the dust, and so was his religion. Seeing Christ, he realized there and then that all his law religion amounted to nothing, to less than nothing. As a matter of fact, he saw it all as a loss, a negative weight. A negative weight? In what way? There in the dust before Christ, he saw that all his zeal, all his law-keeping, all his Jewish credentials, all his observances about which he had boasted so much, and of which he had thought so highly. He saw that all that, far from bringing him to God, he saw that all that, far from bringing him to God, far from enabling him truly to worship and serve God, actually kept him from knowing the true and only way of righteousness. The law was not part of the solution to his problem after all. Far from it. Indeed, the law and his striving to keep it was an integral part of the problem itself. Confronted by Christ, he saw that justification came not by his observance of the law, but entirely and only by trust in the obedience and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And thus, Relinquishing all his former hopes based on the law, he trusted Christ alone. And now, thirty years after that experience outside Damascus, writing this letter, he's still of the same opinion. Indeed, he's even more convinced than he had been then. He has gone even further. He now realizes that it isn't just his Jewish credentials and the law which gets in the way of his knowing God and worshipping him aright, anything and everything other than Christ or in addition to Christ would keep him from salvation. As a result, he now reckons everything apart from Christ to be a loss. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. All things. Nothing could compare with Christ. 
nothing would compare with Christ in his estimation. But it was not only that he counted such things as loss. For Christ, he could say, I have actually suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Nothing that the Judaizers could offer him or demand from him could in any way come close to Christ and salvation by him. The law? Let them have the law. Nothing could compare to Christ. Everything other than Christ, everything including his Jewishness and his law observance, he knew to be rubbish. To yield an inch to the Judaizers would take him back into the morass from which Christ had extricated him. So far, so good. We can all agree. Justification is not by the law. It is by faith in Christ, apart from law works. Righteousness comes to the believer from God through faith without the law. Very good. So what's the fuss? Just this. Notice how the apostle goes on. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I refer in particular to these words that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. What is their significance? Up to and including verse 9, the apostle has been talking about justification. There's no question of it. Justification is by Christ through faith and not by the law. Very well. But at verse 10, Paul moves from justification into sanctification. There's no question of it. He now begins to talk about the experience of knowing Christ after justification. He speaks of enjoying Christ's power in his life, sharing in Christ's sufferings, being more and more conformed to Christ, pressing on, laying hold of the hope for which Christ had taken hold of him and saved him. By using such language, it's clear that the apostle is now thinking not about justification, but about his way of life after justification, namely sanctification. This is such a vital point, I must underscore it. We must not miss the Apostle's emphasis here. He is speaking about his life, his experience, his daily walk after his justification. Paul wants to enjoy Christ, to grow up into Christ, to experience Christ, and do so more and more day by day. He's justified, yes, but he's not satisfied in knowing that he is justified as a forensic fact. He wants to lay hold of all that Christ intended when he laid hold of him. He yearns to attain to it all. He wants to be perfected. He longs to go on to feel, to experience, to enjoy Christ, and to do so throughout the rest of his life and in every aspect of his life, and to do so more and more. His course and his sight are ever upward, verse 14. He wants to apprehend, verse 13, 
when the apostle speaks of knowing Christ, he uses a verb which means to know by personal experience. In all this, the apostle is clearly thinking of sanctification. This is what he desires. Listen to the way in which he expresses himself in the verses which follow, as he urges the Philippians to join him in pursuing the same course. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. Spurgeon, who certainly grasped what Paul was speaking about, closed his sermon on the passage in this way. I desire that you should feel the resurrection power. We have many technical Christians who know the phrases of godliness, but know not the power of godliness. We have ritualistic Christians who stickle for the outward, but know not the power. We have many moral religionists, but they also know not the power. We are pestered with conventional regulation Christians. Oh, yes, no doubt we are Christians, but we are not enthusiasts, fanatics, not even as this bigot. Such men have a name to live and are dead. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power of it. I pray you, my hearers, be not content with the truth till you feel the force of it. Do not praise the spiritual food set before you, but eat of it till you know its power to nourish. Do not even talk of Jesus till you know his power to save. God grant that you may know the powers of the world to come. For Jesus' sake, amen. Even so, Granting all we have seen thus far, still we have not finished with the Apostle's words in this passage. Do not forget the context. Paul is addressing the Philippians in light of the Judaizers' attack upon them. That is what prompted the Apostle to speak in this way at this time. And so he now swings back, weeping, to those dogs, those evil workers, the enemies of the cross of Christ, having spelled out the things he is longing for and looking for. As a result of the grace of God in Christ, he lists the things they, the Judaizers, cherish, the things their doctrine produces. Furthermore, mincing no words, he states the end to which they are going, verses 18 to 19. Once again, he pulls no punches. As for the Judaizers, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. He himself, however, is looking for eternal glory. They can only expect destruction, full bellies now, and eternal damnation to follow. Strong stuff. I fail to see how the apostle could have made his meaning any more stark. What has all this to do with the believer in the law? A great deal. Remember the Philippians were believers before the Judaizers got at them. Paul himself had preached the gospel to the Philippians, and done so without any mention of the law. And he had seen them converted and baptized. Acts 16. But these false teachers had now come to Philippi, and were preaching the law to these believers, and calling upon them to submit to it. In light of this attack upon the Philippians, the attempt to get believers under the law, how heavily the apostle lays into the Judaizers. 
He punches with all the weight he can muster. He misses no trick. He pulls out every stop. This is no secondary matter, no gray area. The believer and the law just do not mix. The Philippians must not think of going under the law. Under no circumstances must they yield to the Judaizers. However plausible their claims, however authoritative their demands, think of what their doctrine produces. Think of the end to which it is taking them. Very well. Believers must not ever think of going under the law. For justification? Of course not. Submit to the law for justification? Never. And Paul says it loud and clear. Verses 2 to 9. But as we have seen, Paul did not leave it there. He knew very well what the Judaizers were up to. He knew what fish they were preparing to fry, and he wouldn't have it at any price. The law will not justify you, assures the Philippians, nor will it sanctify you. Ah, here we reach the crunch. After all, the Philippians were believers already and therefore justified. Sanctification was the main concern. And according to Paul, the law will no more sanctify than it will justify. This was the issue at Philippi. It's the very thing Paul deals with from verse 10 and on. And this is the very issue on which I am writing. Now, if ever there was a time and a place where the apostles should have set out Calvin's third use of the law, this is it. That is, if he believed it. If Calvin was right, at the end of verse 9, the apostle would have said, should have said, words to the effect that although the law has no part to play in the sinner's justification, it does, of course, play a vital part in the saints' sanctification. The fact that the apostle, though speaking so plainly and so earnestly about sanctification and doing so when expressly refuting men who wanted to take believers under the law says nothing of any place for the law in that sanctification is of massive importance in this debate. It must not be missed, glossed over, or ignored. Let me spell it out. The Judaizers were attacking the Philippians, pressing them to submit themselves to the law. And Paul laid into them, punching as hard as he could, including dogs and rubbish, stopping up every loophole, destroying every argument. But, according to the Reformed view, he failed miserably as a teacher. For he left the Philippians with quite the, quote, wrong impression. He left them believing that everything in the Christian life, principally justification, sanctification, and glorification, are in and through Christ and not by the law. So much so, under no circumstances whatever must they go under the law and submit themselves to it. This is the unmistakable impression he left the Philippians with. But in so doing, According to advocates of Calvin's third use of the law, Paul made a dreadful mistake. He was terribly remiss. Apparently, we have to believe, the apostle failed to make himself clear. He should have stated the reform view on this vital issue. And this is precisely the point at which he should have stated it, and stated it unambiguously. He could have done it once and for all. It's perfectly easy to do it. Let me show you. The apostle should have said something along these lines. Don't go under the law for justification. Trust Christ and Christ alone. But of course, having trusted Christ for your justification, you must submit to the law for sanctification. That is what I do myself. You too must submit to the law for sanctification. The law will be the motive and the means of your sanctification. It is your perfect rule. But he did not say it. He said nothing of the sort. In fact, he left the distinct impression that believers should not submit to the law under any circumstance. He told them that Christ is all. 
and so he made a dreadful, quote, mistake. A mistake which has cost millions of believers dear. Don't forget that the apostle was meeting this problem everywhere. Why did he not do the one thing necessary and spell out Calvin's threefold use of the law once and for all? What a world of trouble he would have saved. Enough of this. An inspired man, a man who was concerned about getting a singular instead of a plural, Galatians 3.16, would never make such a puerile blunder as this. He would never miss such an open goal or fail to grasp such a golden opportunity. In fact, if he really did make such a mistake, I fail to see how he can be thought of as a master teacher, 1 Corinthians 3.10. And don't forget, as I've just said, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Why didn't the Spirit spell it all out through his servant? After all, Christ promised that the Spirit would lead his apostles into all truth. I simply cannot accept this kind of talk. It verges on the blasphemous. There's only one possible deduction. Calvin's view that the believer must submit to the law in order to be sanctified is utterly wrong. And in putting it like that, I am failing to use the strength of language employed by the apostle. I should use his word. I will use it and call it rubbish. As he said earlier in the letter, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Philippians 1.27 Not you notice, worthy of the law of Moses. Paul did not press the law upon his readers in order to produce godliness, neither as its rule nor motive. Rather, he had rounded on those who were trying to do it. Not only that, he stressed the gospel for sanctification. Moses, go to Christ. Go to Christ. Look to Christ for all things. I say it again, believers must never think of going under the law for sanctification.